All right, I think we're going to get started here. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joey Katz. I'm the program associate with Boston Jewish Film, and we are thrilled to welcome you all um, to the first uh, Q&A in our literary book theme day. Um, we have uh, two live Q&A sessions centered around Jewish author Saul Bellow, which will be later in the day, and Yiddish poet Abraham Sutzkever, which is today's program. Um, to celebrate and complement this special event, uh, our partners at the Brookline Booksmith have curated a really wonderful collection of works by Jewish authors, including Bello and Sutzkever. Um, and since you have all purchased tickets or a pass um, to view um, who will remain, um, and maybe as well Saul Bello, you do enjoy, uh, you do receive a 20% discount um, for all new books, including the ones that our friends at the Brookline Booksmith have curated. So yeah, um, we are also really happy to be partnering with the Yiddish Book Center for uh, Who Will Remain, a film that they produced. Um, but without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce our esteemed uh, panel here today. Um, I'm really thrilled to be joined by the co-directors and uh, a wonderful moderator and filmmaker as well. Um, so we're gonna start here. Um, Emily Felder is one of the directors of Who Will Remain. Uh, she is a documentary film editor whose works have been screened in museums, libraries, and schools across the country. Uh, she studied anthropology at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, where she became invested in archeology, span visual ethnography, and nonfiction storytelling. She worked as the premier technical assistant for the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project and as an assistant editor at Florentine Films Hot Productions um, on feature length documentaries broadcast on PBS. She is now an editor and videographer based in LA where she continues to make films. All right. Hi, Emily. Hello. <laughs> Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Chris, uh, Krista Whitney, one of the other directors of Who Will Remain. Uh, originally from Northern California, Krista discovered Yiddish while studying comparative literature at Smith College. She has studied Yiddish language at the Vilnius Yiddish Institute, the Workman's Circle, and the Yiddish Book Center. For the past 10 years, she has directed the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project, traveling near and far recording oral history interviews managing a video archive and producing documentary films and web features about all aspects of Yiddish language and culture. Welcome, Krista. Thanks, Shalom Aleichem, great to be here. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have our moderator for today, Larry Hott. Um, Larry has been producing documentary films since 1978 when he left the practice of law to join Florentine Films. Um, sounds familiar. We have a lot of connections here in this uh, uh, panel today. Um, his awards include an Emmy, two Academy Award nominations, a George Foster Peabody Award, the DuPont Columbia Journalism Award, and so much more. Uh, <laughs> um, we, uh, he's received the Humanity Achievement Award from the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities 1995 and the Rosalind Carter Fellowship for mental health journalism in 2001. So thank you, Larry, for uh, leading this discussion. We're really happy to have you all here. I will turn over the program to you and um, yeah, enjoy everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thanks to the Boston Jewish Film Festival for hosting this event. I'm going to start off with a profound question for both Emily and Krista. I'm gonna ask you what this film is about. Now that might sound like a inane question, but I found this film to be about so many things that when you were editing it, I'm wondering, did you keep asking yourselves, what is this film really about? For example, is it about poetry? Is it about the Holocaust? Is it about uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome for the descendants of people who survived the Holocaust? Is it about Yiddish versus Hebrew? Is it about performing? Um, what is this film about? And did that, was that a challenge for you when you were in the editing room? I'll start with Emily. Absolutely, thank you, Larry. That's an amazing, great first question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, this film was an outgrowth of the oral history project and Krista had recorded oral history interviews with Hadass and her aunt Mira in Israel in 2014. And we had been developing, you know, short format editorial content from the archive. And yeah, we, we had such an abundance of artifacts from Hadass that we realized we really wanted to inform, you know, the public about Sutzkever, you know, and if you didn't know anything about Yiddish poetry, what better uh, poet to, to introduce you to this language. But of course, given the, given the subject matter, we realized this can't just be, or, or maybe it shouldn't just be about the family story. There needs to be some biographic context. And then because it's about poetry, we were so lucky to have the archival recordings of his actual voice. And so it really did develop into this synthesis of, you know, oral history, biography, and then autobiography. Um, so this film is really yeah, about all three. Um, and Krista, did, Krista was you the same question to you. Do you know what it was about? Did you did you change in the middle or did you throw your hands up in the air and say, oh, my God, I'm not sure what this film is about halfway through it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it, it's uh, there's so many different answers to that question swirling around in my mind. I mean, uh, for me, I, I you know, to start with the personal, it was an homage to the poet who inspired me to enter this field. I mean, it was really reading Avram Sutzkever as an undergrad at Smith that I said, whoa, what is this? You know, I want to learn more about this. So on the personal level, there's that. Um, I think to me, um, another, it's certainly about the, the place of Yiddish in the world today for me. I think I see the way the film sort of, it takes us around uh, these different geographic locations. And I think for me, having studied in, in Vilna and, and also traveled to Tel Aviv to do those interviews, to me, it's, a, it, it's in part about the, what is Yiddish, Jewish history, memory of the Holocaust in these different places and for these different generations. So, so I think one thing that really developed as we were working on the film was okay, are we, as you sort of embedded in your question, are we telling Sitzkever's story or are we telling the story of, you know, of the, the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors? And I think those are both there in the film and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, create a nice, created a nice sort of creative tension for us as we were trying to, to figure out what to include and what not to include in the film. Are you told me that you inherited footage, that you came to the film with a lot of footage in hand from Hadass, sent it to you on a hard drive, I believe. And you shot, I don't know how many interviews, but you didn't do a lot of original shooting for this. So what do you think is missing? What would you have shot if you could? If you had a bigger budget, what would you go after? What, 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 what do you feel would have been nice to have in the editing room that you didn't have because you were using found footage? Do you want to take that, Emily? It's yeah, so hard. I, that's, that's great also question. a really great question. I think it would, I, I think I would have loved to have access perhaps in Israel and see Hadass at home with her family and in not just in Vilna and, and what um, the impact of that entire experience was like. I would love to have seen maybe more of just yet yeah, the day to day what what it's like in their home in that space now and where Sutskever ultimately immigrated to um, what that must be like you know it's just worlds apart um, so that would have been I guess an aiding visual that would have been very compelling to include. Yeah, Chris, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have this wonderful, you know, one of the main inspirations for for me, at least in saying we had to make this film was when we got those home videos and sort of seeing them um, interact, the generations interact in that home. So I would agree with that. 
I mean, I think the main answer is I would have loved to interview Sutskever, but he was gone. So, <laughs> you know, in an alternate universe, we would have started this film a decade earlier and, and had that opportunity. I think also there's wonderful footage of contemporary Vilnius in, in the in the film. And, and that might have been, you know, had we had budget, I think probably we would have also gone um, and and shot some of our own own sort of b-roll or you know um we we inherited that wonderful footage that uh, of the family going there but it would have been amazing to to return and, and get to sort of be in that space together well i want to ask you about that and if i have this right that the end of the film is what i call the hadas show where the footage for putting it on a play in, in vilnius i think is that right um no this is a pretty big moment in the film and i was wondering whether you had questions about it yourself because it's so much about Hadass and is it redemption? Is it the importance of what survivors do? Is it the idea of having Israelis in Lithuania? Or is it really just this is her expiation or this is what she needs to do to feel whole? Or is it about her as an actor and that she wants to promote herself? Um, to th that, what did you feel about putting that in at the end? Did you have any doubts about it, questions about it? It was it was a challenge to figure out how to wrap up the film. I mean, we spent five years making the film, and we there were periods in there in the middle. I would say year three and four, where we were sort of struggling with how do we wrap up this story? You know, how, where do because it's of course ongoing. Um, I think for me it was about and about how can we you know does Hadass come to closure herself? That was the question I had. Mm -hmm. And I think she, you know, the last words in the film that she has, you know, I think that's enough, you know, and maybe the end of the story, if she says something like that, that was actually the very end of the oral history. That's how she closed the oral history. So I felt like, at least from my um, interaction with her and the way that she presented her story, that that was her closure. Well, so, at the end, she says, God will remain, or somebody says, God will remain. Is that enough for you? Is she quoting Sutsker? Can you remind me of what that, what oh, that yeah. line is? Yeah, so that's Sutsker himself. That's the, the end of the, the last stanza of the poem, Vervet Bleiben. Um, so we really, we wanted to give him the last word. Um, yeah. You know, that was important to us uh, because, again, you have the, in a way, you know, we're putting Hadass in conversation with, her grandfather in the film and and um you know he's gone but his poetry is there so that's what she has to to interact with so we did want to give him the last word that was important to us so i want to ask you about the words of satskaver we've been dancing around satskaver talking about the, the family and what the film means but he is the central character and in a way his poetry is a central character um what scared you about starting the production of film that's essentially about poetry poetry is abstract it's not necessarily visual, although it's supposed to evoke visual things. Uh, did you have challenges about how am I going to illustrate this? Tell me about what the challenges for you as filmmakers were working with poetry. Emily, I'll just turn it over sure. to you. Sure. Yeah, I think I think one of the most challenging aspects with that was to decide which poems of his were we going to incorporate. We were so lucky to, to have recordings in his own voice, but we can't just, this isn't going to be an audio book. We need to, as you're saying, um, put consider what visuals are going to be uh, most critical, but we, we couldn't possibly use all of the, the recordings. So working together, we had to sort of figure out which of his poems are we going to use? Um, and Vervet Blyven sort of emerged early on as this is super powerful. And, and then are we going to, you know, just present stanzas in full, like right, you know, just from top to tail? Or is this going to be interwoven throughout the piece? So that was incredibly challenging. I want to throw this to Krista, but I want to phrase it in a different way. There's a line in the film about poetry under pressure. And I'm going to ask you, did that resonate for you? Um, I think it's something about surmounting indignity. So you're making, everybody who makes a film is making filmmaking, 
is making a film under pressure in some way, either time constraints or money constraints, or just when am I going to finish this thing, get it off my plate. Um, so here you are making a film, essentially in the end, the, the, the crux of the, of the film is being in the forest and writing poetry as a, as a in the resistance. You, know, you could be killed any day. So you're not going to be killed in the editing room, except metaphorically. But did it resonate for you that you were making a, a film under pressure when you're making a film about poetry under pressure? Um, I, I don't know that I thought about it that way, um, but it's interesting to frame it that way. You know, I would just back up a little bit in my story with Emily, which is we had practice. We had made a couple of short films about Yiddish poets. And so I think had we not made those shorts, we would have, it would have, we did work through kind of some of those challenges um, and, and a sort of brave decision to just put the poetry in the film, even though people might not connect to it, it might be esoteric to people um, and just, uh, but we felt we didn't want to sort of, um, we didn't want to tone that down. We wanted we wanted the Yiddish words in there, um, and the uh, so in that in that sense, there's. I mean, I don't know. I can't make the analogy to to being a partisan. I don't think anyone can, <laughs> you know, um, say that that was analogous. But I do think there was a sense of uh, defiance, sort of in a way of like, you know, what people might not not find connect to the poetry I think for me where the fear came in when she used that word was are people going to realize what a great poet he is are we doing the poetry justice mm -hmm. in the film and as you know since we started with you know uh, falling in love with the poetry um, that was uh, that was a bit of fear but I found the quality of the poetry high. It, it's translated, but I can get a sense of the rhythm from the Yiddish reading. Um, there's a line in there about he could only be saved if he could write poetry worthy of his salvation and that the Nazis had no control. But in the editing room, did you feel like you had control or did the film control you? Wow, yeah. Um... There was a key moment in the editing process um, and that happened to be where and how to incorporate the Nuremberg testimony. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that, you know, that's, you know, he was the only Jewish witness to speak there. Um, and so, as you know, Larry, documentary films, they evolved dramatically throughout the editing process, especially as we were amassing materials at the same time, trying to figure out, okay, you know, what else can we incorporate? Um, and so this became, you know, it's not just a, a creative intention, it's, there was also the question of like the ethical intention behind this. Um, and so as is customary, when you receive raw footage, you're looking, you know, how can I edit this down? Where am I going to put this? And so with the Nuremberg testimony, I was cutting it up and putting it here, putting it there, weaving it in, and it just wasn't working. And we decided ultimately, we're going to just put in this three minute testimony in full and let him speak for himself and kind of have this be become the apex of the film in a way, and that this is that this film could be a presentation of like the ultimate act of defiance of I'm going to speak at the Nuremberg trial mm -hmm. and 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 be the witness to to this history. So yeah, I think that answers your question. Yeah. I had questions about the opening of the film. There's two openings really, right? There's the, there's the uh, the chorus, the choir, which you makes you think, well, this person must be pretty special if this is big choir singing hallelujahs to him, uh, or hosannas maybe. And then you're in the living room and this is old couple. They could be anybody. And it, it's like that old joke, do you know who I used to be? Um, and then the film proceeds to give you a sense of who he used to be at, at least. And I'm curious about your reaction to that footage. He, you, you said something in there about that him being an outsider. Uh, I can't remember who says it, but he's a, a feat. Um, but he doesn't look like an outsider in the family footage. He's just like a nice old Zadie. So what, what do you feel about him now? Was he an outsider? Was he an insider? Is as important as uh, 
you make him out to be in the film after you've gotten to know him and the family? Yeah, I mean, I think the there's something about that footage that really, I don't know that everyone would have this takeaway, but the way that it, you know, there's the Seder table and then it pans over to the couch and there are, there are of Rome and Fredka sitting there. To me, there's so much in just in that moment that you're, you know, Hadass talks about, you know, when in her experience growing up, the, her grandparents speak another language. They come, why? Because they come from another country. And in that, you know, family dynamics for, I don't, I mean, I would love to have been able to ask them, why were you not participating in the state? Or you can ask lots of, you can interpret a lot of um, things onto that moment, but at least you are seeing there the separation of generations. Um, and yet he was very active in, you know, in when you see in, in the Israel prize footage, you know, he is, he is being honored. And I don't think he's surprised to be honored, uh, frankly, by the Israeli government. He, so he's both, you know, he was the representative of a language that was not welcome in the early state. Um, and, and yet he was also praised for that work. So there's, there are these um, dualities and sort of um, tension in, in who he represented, you know, he represented Eastern Europe, he represented the, the Holocaust uh, survivor generation, but he also was bringing, creating new culture. So I think, um, I don't know, I do think he is, he is as influential as, um, as we thought he was in starting. And I think you're seeing that now in people um, translating his work. There are two new translations, this in 2021 that just came out. Um, so, so I do think, uh, yeah, he's all of those things. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you a question that relates to this about his importance. There's the story you tell, which is very powerful about the Soviet Union evacuating South Korea during the war, sending a plane. Um, and that's when I heard that, I thought, well, who does that for a poet? Um, you know, that's a lot of trouble, a lot of risk. And I'm curious about the, your thoughts about that. So for you in the film, is this like a crucial moment? And just, just as people, what do you think about the Soviet Union at that time elevating him to such stature? What, yeah, I think you leave, it's, it's not time in the film to do everything, but it seems to leave hanging a question of what does he do once he gets there that they have evacuated him? How are they using it? Is it for propaganda? They're not doing it just because they're nice people. Uh, so can you give me a better sense of why he was evacuated and what happened afterwards? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's certainly, Ehrenberg is, is sort of the crux of that story. And I have, you know, tried to read up on this. Um, it, it often leaves me with more questions than answers, of course. But, you know, I think in order to understand that uh, dynamic, we have to look at what was going on in the Soviet Union at that time. Um, they're, you know, trying to get support for the war effort. They're trying to, um, yes, keep the spirits up of their um, population, which are, you know, being killed en masse at the, at the front lines of this war. Um, and they're also, you know, it's hard not to sort of, uh, to, back shadow what we know is sort of brewing in terms of world um, tension in that moment and a country that is, um, uh, you know, trying to present itself in a certain way. So I think he was certainly um, seen as a, and also you have to see it in the context of Russian culture and Eastern European culture in general, where poetry is, has a very different role than it does, um, I would say in, in American culture that poetry is, there's a long history of using poetry um, in for political <laughs> uh, 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 propaganda reasons. So I see that, I see him, him in that moment, certainly in that context. And I would just add that that footage we have, that was another amazing moment in the editing process. We had saw some little reference to Sutskever in the Soviet Union, in the Holocaust, US Holocaust Museum um, archives. And it took us a long time to track down this footage. 
we gave up a few times and then our um our, our post-production assistant Emily Densmore really helped uh dig dig and and um and actually when we saw that footage of him in this huge stage and the Jewish anti-fascist committee sort of um what what provocative sort of image to see him there it just reminded me that uh during World War II, the United States was flying Glenn Miller around, who a uh, band leader who was lost. But you know, it, it's a sense of what we appreciated. We wanted, you know, the USA shows were not featuring poets; we were featuring uh, Hollywood stars and, and musicians. So maybe it's just what the society values at that time. And some um, Yiddish actors too, Larry. I would add, no, were in well, the USA. Well, there's another film subject right there. Um, <laughs> There's a couple other lines in the film that resonated for me. Um, one was that Susskiver was not writing for translation like I.B. Singer. Um, I'm wondering about how you felt about that line. I'd Singer is such an icon known far and wide, not just um, among Yiddish speakers or Jews. Um, was, this a, was he really dissing him or was he just saying, this is what I do? Or was there an internecine, internecine battle going on? Well, I can I can take a stab at that. That I think they're in the Yiddish world, as in sort of any um, literary circle. When someone wins the Nobel Prize, everyone talks about who should have won it instead. <laughs> and Sitzkever was certainly on that high up on the list of the popular vote. Um, so I do think you you get a bit of um, of competition there. I also think I I think Ruth Weiss is this is directly from her. Um, that's, and I think you, you do see some of that is because it's poetry, you know, and that, um, you know, poetry is usually not for a popular audience, um, the way maybe a novel might be, mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, it, it also goes to his ideology and, um, uh, you know, he was doing the work for the work's sake. I think he didn't, you know, pass on, for example, his literary journal to the next generation, which is a big question um, about why he didn't do that. And, and I think, yeah, there are unanswered questions there, but I think he was very committed to high quality uh, art for, for, um, for sort of spiritual and artistic sake. And he, um, yeah, well, you, made, you made a point about uh, Chagall illustrating mm -hmm. some of the, of the work and the line in there, the more fantastical, the closer to reality. Um, and so Chagall, sort of the embodiment of the fantastical, well, did, did, what did that mean to you? And it, were you, would you have liked to be more fantastical in the film? Let's say, you know, would you have liked to have more animation or more color or what would you have done if you could have been more fantastical? Well, one one thing, you know, we have we have Chagall's artwork, but we also have Franz Marc's artwork. And for those who might not know, uh, Marc was actually a German expressionist painter who was drafted during World War One. And he but he died at the Battle of Verdun. And later, the Nazis actually labeled him a degenerate artist. And 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 so, as we know, the Nazis banned and sanctioned any work that wasn't exalting the state. And, and so like anything like jazz, you know, it was seen as communist or Jewish or otherwise, you know, a societal threat to conservative German values. And so I had previously known Mark's history and like this series of deer paintings that we set to mm -hmm. um, Sutzkever's uh, recitation of his Red Sea um, or Dead Sea poem, in which he describes a deer coming to the shore and, and drinking uh, the silence of those who will no more appear. And I realized that, you know, a sequence of Marx paintings, which are these, you know, beautiful expressionist kind of fantastical paintings of deer in which he actually has one titled Dead Deer, you know, that could be in its own way, um, speaking to what you're saying, Larry, of, you know, the more fantastical, and this could be in its own small way, an homage to Siskiver's, you know, theme of defiance and fantastical reality. So we've got a question from the viewers um, from Barbara Resnick. Thanks, Barbara. 
Um, how did he survive the war before he went into the forest? Who read and maybe translated his poetry that it had such success in Russia and among young um, and among non-Yiddish literate people? Well, I will plug a new uh, book that just came out um, by by my mentor Justin Cami, um, which is uh, the translation of his. Um, his own autobiography of the wartime. And so you can learn a lot, all the details of his survival in that, in that new translation. Um, it's, you know, as with any story of survival in that time, there are many, many different moments where he was saved by miracle, um, luck, uh, assistance of um, of strangers and and friends. Um, he was in he was in Vilna uh, for most of that period, and then escaped um, into the forest. and And we see that a little bit more about that in the film. Um, and to the second question, I think um, you, in order to answer that question, it again sort of goes into to what was going on in the Soviet Union at that time. Um, the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee was a group of Jewish artists who were um, working, uh, you know, creating work for that, you know, that was in, in some way state sanctioned for, for the, the, the causes of the state at that time. And, and so there were Jewish artists who were um, Yiddish speakers in that group and, and, and also uh, Russian uh, writers such as Ilya Ehrenberg. And so it was really, as I understand it, through Ehrenberg that um, he, that, that uh, his case was sort of presented to, to the Soviet officials um, and, uh, and that's how he was rescued. You know, there must have been a temptation on your part to bring in historians um, and writers and critics um, I want to ask you a kind of an inside baseball filmmaking question. Did you feel you were saved by the fact that you didn't have the budget to go around the world finding these people? That it might have made your job easier to just be narrow and just concentrate on the footage you had and the one interview that you had? Um, that's such a good question. And I, to that, I would say in, in the film, and when we were editing, when I was editing, you know, this subject matter, you know, of the Holocaust, there's actually, there's only one shot in the entire movie that actually shows um, victims. Um, and, and Kristen and I talked about this of, of not showing any uh, death camps or, or anything like that, because I think it represents our, our present day lived experience that Hadass is experiencing too of, you know, we weren't there. And so how could we make sense of it like Hadass who can only hear about it? Mm -hmm. And so the challenge, but I think like the, the beauty of this film is like how powerful would it be on its own without the, the documented proof of which we know obviously there is abundant horrific evidence, you know, how powerful would it be if we just have the poetry to be the transmission of that memory, to be the to to let it speak for itself, it's enough. Right, you know, you just reminded me of the very powerful story at the beginning of the film of how Sutskever does not get into the writing collective as a youth, and how maybe not getting in serves him well, um, and that brings up this whole question of the path that life takes you on, uh, that maybe things that you think you want aren't the things that are actually gonna turn out best for you. And I wanted to ask you about that scene. How did you feel about that? It's a very poignant scene and it actually stayed with me throughout the whole film. I think you come back to it at the end. Could you remind me how you come back to it here? Cause there's something quote that he says about it. Yeah, yeah, actually that's um, uh, Ruth uh, Weiss comes back, sort of brings it back in her own lecture that we used um, as the narration of the film, sort of comparing uh, comparing his, um, 
uh, sort of the the idea of acceptance and sort of what is poetry for? Is it for to get into Young Vilna or a group like that to that society? Or is there some higher purpose? And, and you know, she really is the originator of, I believe, this, this framework of him making a contract with the angel of poetry in the more and saying, okay, mm-hmm. if you, you know, I'm, I will, if I survive, it's going to be because I wrote poetry um, that was of high enough caliber to, to merit my survival. Um, and, you know, she knew him and I think, uh, you know, I'm, I would love to have been a fly on the wall in their conversations. I'm sure they, that she, she got this from him. I did want to add one thing about sort of the idea of restriction, because I think that, um, and sort of limitation, it, it brings me back to the, where this, where our, where the film, uh, comes out of, which is the oral history project at the Yiddish Book Center. And the fact that we, the way that the oral history is set up and the the limitations of budget and geography, um, although Zoom, you know, now has changed this somewhat, but is that, you know, we go somewhere and we interview someone and it's, we're meeting them on that day and we have our three hours with them and you know, and if I'm going to, you know, Tel Aviv and I have I have a full schedule where I'm interviewing two to a couple of people a day, I'm not usually going to get a second chance. And so I, I feel that that sort of um, it's a, it's a framework that Emily and I were familiar uh, uh, working in. You know, you don't get a second take. Um, well, that is actually a good segue to one of my last questions, which is the the second life of Satsukiver, and it comes out Hadas is not a Yiddish speaker, and she mentions that you know Yiddish is not going over well in Israel at the time that he emigrates, and then um, in the Ponar Forest section there's uh, a line about the power of poetry to voice defiance, and how I think it's phrased like this: the survival of Jewish values can depend on it, but. There's been this big debate for a hundred or more years that maybe Yiddish isn't about Jewish survival. Yiddish is its own thing. Yiddish kite is its own world, and Jewish values are something different. So I'm just interested in your personal opinion about this. Do you see them really intersecting still? Uh, we've that generation that grew up with Yiddish values, my Bubby and Zadie, they're gone. So how do you feel about it now, having worked on this film? I mean, that's a question that I deal with, uh, I think, every day in my, in my work at the Yiddish Book Center. And I think that many of us, you know, we, we there, there is that tension and also hope looking to a new generation coming up of, you know, Emily and my contemporaries and younger who are discovering value in the language and the culture. I mean, looking at the amazing work of my colleagues at the center in working in translation and education and um and the the publications and the public programs that there is a um a curiosity of okay maybe it's not the daily language of course there are people for whom it is still the daily language but even if it's not there is something here that we don't want to let go or maybe it it was lost in the family and and I don't, I want to reclaim it. Um, So, so I certainly think, you know, it's not, I don't have illusions of Yiddish becoming sort of mainstream, (laughs) Um, but I do think there, there are, you know, and in the oral history work, I've had the privilege of hearing so many different people talk about the way that Yiddish found them or they found Yiddish or they found their way back to Yiddish in some, in, in some cases um, and how it can be intensely meaningful and, and often quite emotionally potent. Mm-hmm. So we're about, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to ask you both for your next project, not what your, is, not what your next project is because everybody wants to know what you're doing next. But what have you learned from the, this production that you would, do in the next project or not do? What have you learned either about the interviewing or archives or the way you write? 
the structure of the film? Is there something now that you feel, all right, I'm not, I've gone up another level. Could you put your finger on what that is? I know that's not an easy question. <laughs> And you can dodge it and go on to something else you think you don't have to. But, that's, that's a um, fair question. Uh, yeah. The, right. the, question, the question again is not what you would do differently in this film, because that's not a fair question. The film's done. Right. But what have you learned from this process about what you would maybe do differently in another film or maybe another artistic endeavor? I mean, for me, I think so much of it has been in, in sort of what's around the film i mean how to i've learned so much just by being thrown into the the world of film festivals and um you know how we've been lucky to have success with this film that we hadn't had in previous films and so i think those skills certainly will carry over to any project i think the more the deeper uh uh answers are really what the conversations that I think Emily and I had over these years about, okay, how are, I mean, the main takeaway, and we've said this in some, in another context is sort of that time is a key element to, uh, to the success of the film in the sense that we took time away from it and returned to it. And that made the film. I mean, the, 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 I, I mean, I think Emily, you would agree with that. Yeah, on that. Absolutely. You know, it was, this is, you know, we, we had made some short films, but this is the first feature length film from the Yiddish Book Center. Mm -hmm. And it was the first feature length film for myself to edit. So that was a learning curve um, to be sure. But yeah, I would agree with Krista that, that taking time, I mean, the number of cuts that we went through are, it's, incredible um but that yeah that we're going to continue to have conversations about you know how this medium can make yiddish more accessible to the public but ultimately yeah confront these questions and and um hopefully transcend some of those challenges of, of time geography etc we have another question from an anonymous question fiddler on the roof was produced in yiddish recently are there other shows that would bring Yiddish to the public? And I think you can change that question also to say, what would you like to see that would bring Yiddish to the, to the public? I mean, I, I think you don't even have to think it up. There are so many people doing amazing work, um, creative work, bringing Yiddish out into the world right now. Um, you know, the again, I would just go back to shouting out my, my colleagues at the, at the Yiddish Book Center. I mean, it just, my hope with this film, one of my hopes is that people will get curious about what else is out there um, and go, you know, check out the thousands of hours that you can spend even on yiddishbookcenter.org exploring the digital collections and recorded programs. Um, and, and so many, like so many, um, other Yiddish organizations and individual artists. Um, so I don't even think I need to create anything uh, imaginary because I just look out there and see um, it, if you go from scholarly work to film, some of the other films and even in the Boston Jewish Film Festival or that we've seen on the circuit this year um, uh, to translation to music. I mean, it's, it's a very rich world. That that question also just reminds me of like the Beatles when they made like their like Hard Day's Night album into German. It's like the the source doesn't have to be, you know, Jewish folklore. It could be something else that you're going. When I heard it in German, I was like, well, that's not, you know, uh, it, too far off from Yiddish. It's like, how awesome would that be if someone, you know, took that on? Like, so mm -hmm. just, just food for thought. Right. Well, we've come to the end of our time limit here. Um, I want to thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Joey Katz from the Boston Jewish Film Festival. All right. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, Emily and Krista. That was a fantastic conversa conversation. Um, as I really hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. I think they did. But um, 
thank you all for joining us for the first uh, event in our literary themed day of programming. Um, if you do want to check out all the amazing work that the Yiddish Book Center is doing, um, we did just post a link for their website in the chat. Um, and um, let me see. And yeah, and there's also, again, there's the uh, Brookline Booksmith who have uh, curated a great selection of Yiddish literature um, and Jewish literature that you can check out. Um, stay tuned. Uh, we will have another uh, program at 3 o'clock p.m. on uh, the adventures of Saul Bellow with uh, Yiddish professor uh, Saul Zeret, who you might all know, um, and the filmmaker Asaf Galay. But again, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Krista, for this incredible film. And thank you, Larry, for just guiding this fantastic conversation. And um, yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you all at the uh, on the virtual side of things. All right. <laughs> Take care, thank everyone. You thank you so you much, Larry. Thank you for Thanks, the opportunity. Okay. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye.